I'm sure the next part will be fabulous. So today and Wednesday will be um, full lectures with new material, and then on Friday it'll just be a tiny bit. Um, so mostly I'll also be going over uh, expectations for the exam. We got hope. So remember to sign up to vote. Today is the last day to register if you're not. And today we're Register. talking about photophosphorylation. So we spent a lot of time right, talking about the mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation, where NADH may be um, basically released oxygen and ATP was formed. Here we're going from something um, that has a very low reduction potential, you'll see in a minute, water. We need energy to actually be able to then drive the electron transport chain to make NADH and ATP. So whereas this is oxidative, right, NADH to NAD+, this is reductive, right? We're actually going from NAD+, to NADPH, and you could also look at it in terms of oxygen being um, the water as the donor here. So this is the ultimate source of nearly all biological energy. And so it's not just that I love plants, but that this is critical to life on Earth. So if we do an overview of photosynthesis, hopefully you've been exposed to this a number of times, like high school, and then maybe bio 1A or B, and then again, um, some of the details, you'll be filling in the details of how this works. So essentially, right, in the there are two sets of reactions, the light and the carbon assimilation, which sometimes people call the dark reactions because they don't require light. However, they require products from the light reactions. So some people really hate when people call them the dark reactions because they require things produced by the light. So basically you have conversion, right, of H2O to oxygen, and you have um, NADP going to NADPH, right, so that's being reduced and you're forming, in the end, ATP, okay. So it's not showing, it's showing it a little bit oddly here because it's coupling everything, right? So NADPH and ATP are formed, what we're gonna talk about today, and then that ATP is actually driving um, the formation of carbohydrates from CO2, and we're gonna talk about this tomorrow, or Wednesday. So, if we look at this, um, the electron potential, right? So when we're doing oxidative phosphorylation and we're comparing now NADH versus water as donors, you can see that NAD, um, NAD plus, right? NAD plus for the other one, the oxidative phosphorylation would be a good donor, but water, right, would be a really bad donor. So light actually is required to create a good electron donor. And this is a quite unusual process, and so we're gonna be going through that today. So first of all, where does it take place? So we know that um, oxidative phosphorylation takes place in the mitochondria, and the reductive photophosphorylation takes place in the chloroplast. Similar to the mitochondria, you have a number of membrane and you have an outer membrane, which is permeable, then you have an inner membrane, then you have these stacks called grana, which are these thylakoid membranes, um, and it's on these membranes there where you have the enzymes involved in light reactions and ATP synthesis. And then you have this space in here, so that's like the matrix essentially, this space in here is the stroma, but we're always going to call it stroma. Okay. And then inside the grana is called the lumen. And you'll see some more pictures of that in a minute. So because this is all about light, we're going to go back to um, some basic physics um, about electromagnetic radiation. So when you have wavelengths, right, um, the visible spectrum is right in here. So this is a huge continuum. And we're talking about visible light going from about 380 nanometers to 750. And the wavelength dictates right, the color. 
So typically with light, right, if it's absorbed, we're not seeing that color, we're seeing that what's not absorbed. And if we convert this to energy, you can see that the energy that's formed from these wavelengths of light is inversely proportional to um, the wavelength. <coughs> so the wavelength, if it's 750, you're only getting 170 kilojoules per Einstein. We'll talk about an Einstein in a second. And if you have um, this lower wavelength light, 380, you're actually getting more. So actually, particularly bacteria, which can use a, a really big range of light, um, depending upon where they absorb, right, they need more photons um, at a certain wavelength than you might, like so for example, up here you would need more photons than if you were absorbing here. And that relationship is actually E equals HC over lambda, where H is the Planck's constant, C is the speed of light, and lambda is just nanometers, wavelength of light in nanometers. Have you all seen this before? Like, raise your hand? Almost everyone? Okay. So, you might not have heard of Einstein. So, an Einstein is one mole of photons, and a photon is a quantum of electromagnetic um, radiation. So, basically, a photon, we're going to be talking in terms of photons needed to then um, move an electron around. So, you can actually do these calculations pretty straightforwardly by putting in the number. So if you have one mole photons of red light here, um, you can do the calculations plugging into this equation, and you would get 170 joules, um, kilojoules per Einstein, where the Einstein is one mole of photons, right? So one mole of photons at 750 would give you, nanometers of light would give you 170 kilojoules. So we're always relating this back to what we're doing, right? So ultimately we're making ATP. So you can see that one mole of photons of red light, right, with 170 kilojoules, that's a lot in terms of making ATP, right? Which we, the standard free energy for ATP is 30.5. So we, we know, okay, good, we actually, like physically, in terms of the thermodynamics, we'd be able to use this to make ATP. And actually, I'm not going to stress it here, but um, the efficiency is actually really similar to oxidative phosphorylation too, where it's calculated at about 30%, but it's actually higher in real life. So when you talk about the excitation of chlorophyll by light, you have a photon coming in, it's exciting a particular molecule, we'll look at detail, the um, excited state, right? The electrons go up in their orbitals. It's a very specific amount of energy that the electrons get excited to a very specific orbital. And then they basically want to return to ground state. And if you return to ground state, you're then releasing heat. And typically, you would have a photon um, of fluorescence, which would be a lower wavelength of light. However, we're really not talking about this here because what happens in photophosphorylation and that electron transport chain is that we don't really lose much here. We are going to transfer it in a special way through chlorophyll molecules to um, final acceptors in the reaction center. So we're using this excited energy here to actually drive the chemical work of photosynthesis as opposed to getting fluorescence and heat. So if we look at the photopigments, um, the primary and secondary photopigments, this is how they absorb the photon. So if you also hear the word chromophore, that's also the part of the molecule that's absorbing that wavelength of light um, and the photon absorption. And chromo, right color, and so the chromophore, and so when you're seeing a visible light spectrum in color, it's because it's able to absorb, and then you're seeing what it's not absorbing. So here, the major ones for plants are chlorophyll A and B, which we'll be talking about in detail today. And they look really similar right here to the structure of hemoglobin, to heme, right? But instead of having um, the iron at the center, you have the magnesium. And if you look over at your periodic table, 
um, you could actually think about, right, how magnesium could be used, or even the potential not happening here to use manganese. So here, magnesium is coordinated. You don't have to memorize the structure, but just be familiar with it. Um, and so in bacteria and also chlorophyll A versus B, you have different decorations of these side chains and sometimes just the bond, uh, but the basic molecule is the same. And then, and those different decorations and that one uh, bond position here and here also slightly change um, what wavelength they absorb. So they also have this um, long chain here, and this is for anchoring to the membrane. So whenever you see, right, a long chain like this, right, just carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, right, you know that that could be associated with the membrane. So this is how it's anchored, um, and they're literally in the membrane. We also have other kinds of, we call them accessory pigments, like beta carotene, like you would think about, right, uh, when you think about carrots, that nice orange color, lutein is like the yellow, um, and this, you get this absorbance through this nice double bond structure um, where you can absorb right, the photons um, and they can pass through this double bond structure to absorb. Okay. So if we look at the absorption of visible light, again, this is probably something you've seen a lot of times, but some of you might not have, so we're gonna talk about it. So we're focused mostly on chlorophyll A, the purple, and chlorophyll B, the green, dominant in plants, and, the, and also the source of the reaction center. So the antenna molecules are these, and then also at the reaction center. And you can see they have two major absorbances, here and here. Um, and then you'll also have the accessory pigments, like beta carotene, that have a range that's a little bit broader. And then exactly where they're positioned. So this is actually um, soluble ones, but then when they're within the protein, they have they just change slightly because it changes their environment. Um, and then um, one of the things that you want to also just have an idea about is that like cyanobacter and bacteria and algae that can do um, uh, this oxidate, sorry, photophosphorylation. They have chromophores, and often they'll be getting this intermediate range in here. So phycor erythrin and biocyanin, um, they are not in plants. They're in like algae, for example, and cyanobacter. Um, and so they're able to get these wavelengths of light that others, or other organisms are not using. So if you were to transfer um, energy, right, you would want to go from the higher energy to the lower energy. So now we're getting into, right, so on that thylakoid membrane, um, we have, so this is the thylakoid membrane, we have these um, photosystems, and the photosystems right now we're um, talking about, anyway, this is true for both. So you'll have a reaction center, and uh, there are about 200 chlorophylls and about 50 carotenoids for this reaction center. And we're actually first going to be talking about photosystem two. And so what happens is light comes in. Um, so you have these photons coming in. And like I said, there's this really efficient transfer. It's like 90% efficiency um, called resonance transfer, or your book calls it excitation transfer. And so basically, it's super fast. Pico, like, just like, like I can't do that, right? It's picoseconds. It's so fast and highly efficient transferring, and it's the positioning of the molecules that allows it to be so efficient. And actually, a lot of work in photosynthesis has been done at Berkeley, like Nobel Prizes, we'll talk about the one next time. Um, but there are people at, in Berkeley now, and the, and the LBNL, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, up on the hill, that are actually looking at what exact path do they take. This still isn't completely understood, and so there are professors here looking at, like, is this random? How exactly does this happen? And developing the tools where they can actually see this. So you get this resonance transfer or excitation transfer to the reaction center. And though you have these chlorophyll molecules all over, 
they are not doing the photophosphorylation. It's only the ones in the special reaction center that do this electron transport. So now we're going to look at the uh, reaction center. So this is for photosystem two. So we're at the reaction center. It's kind of showing it in um, a different way. Um, it's kind of useful, but so basically here you have antenna molecules. So these are chlorophylls that have been passed, right? The um, excitons, and it's coming in, right? So light is coming in. It's exciting this electron up to here. Oh yeah, I want to show you one thing. Um, so you can see for chlorophyll A, the dominant one in the reaction center, that peak is about 680. And you'll see that when we get to the photosystem that it's often called um, 680, so we'll, and that's fine. Okay. So the light comes in, and so this is where we're starting. So we have um, the electrons in this ground state, and then the reaction center, up here, so this is actually a separate molecule in the electron transport chain at the reaction center. So up here, you're actually going to have um, theophytin in this color. And then down here, you have the electron donor, which is water. And in the middle, the blue, is the special chlorophyll in the reaction center. So what's happening here, right, is when light comes in, you excite this. Then that transfers to the other one here excites it, and then this excited one is actually going to transfer over to this chlorophyll right here. So you can see it moved from this orbit, like you can think of it as an orbital, but from this um, energy position right higher, it accepted the electron. And now with that movement, um, we, it actually can go to the pheophyton as an acceptor. So it actually now, watch, the electron is going to pheophyton. So it's going up here. We're going to look at it again next slide in a different way. So this accepted an electron, and then it left. So it's negatively charged here. And it left a hole, right? There's no electrons here now associated with those special chlorophylls in the reaction center. And so to denote that electron hole, we put a positive sign. So now there's, right, just because of thermodynamics, you want to fill that electron hole. And so the donor of water, which is typically not a good donor, but now with this charge separation, this electron hole, it can donate an electron okay, back to the chlorophyll. So the donor was water, the reaction chlorophyll are here, and the acceptor is the light. So now we'll look at this the standard way. So the importance of seeing this is just this kind of thing about the charge separation, which is quite unusual. So if we look at it here, this is often called the Z scheme, and you're not yet seeing the Z, because I'm showing you part at a time. But basically, we're going um, from here, water to plastic zero. So you have light coming in, and right, it's exciting it. It's at P680. That's what I just mentioned before, because that's that strong absorbance of the chlorophyll A. It's being excited. So over here, we have reduction potential in electrons. So you could calculate right, that delta E to actually see right, how that would drive ATP synthesis, for example, which uh, people have done. So you have that excitation. Then that electron is um, going to theophyton. And then from there, it's going to plastic widow. And then we'll do a second widow. So these, we'll talk about them more in a minute. These are more sim very similar to um, the um, ubiquinone, and they serve a really similar uh, function. So as light is coming in and that electron is going up here, right, you have the water donating that electron to replenish the P680. So how does that happen, that water splitting activity? So it's uh, so this is all in photosystem two, and you'll see in the next slide that there's a particular peptide called the D1 polypeptide, and it has this unusual center that has manganese and calcium, and these manganese um, are actually you can see 
you in each case when they're getting um, oxidized. And so you're adding, you're getting to one plus, two plus, three plus, four plus. And so what's happening here is that with each of these, right, and that's because of the properties of manganese and calcium and how they're actually coordinated in the reaction circuit. So the water, um, you're actually getting an electron going to a special tyrosine residue that's in the D1 polypeptide, and then that transfer allows transfer of electrons to um, the P680. And then that's happening again, 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 until we get to this full state, and then you have more water. So you're removing four electrons from two molecules of water, Right, so the electron, 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 and you're producing O2. So this is requiring four photons, one per electron to do this. So if we look at it now in the context of photosystems, so um, in the study of photosynthesis, um, a lot of work has been done in all different systems, right? Because you use what's easiest. So a lot of the initial work was done um, in either cyanobacter or other systems that could be more easily worked with. Um, and then we moved into plants, which were more complicated um, in terms of uh, the combination of photosystems. So we're going to look at photosystem 2 of cyanobacterium, but really similar to photosystem 2 of plants. So basically what's happening here is you have this um, excitation of the P680 by light. In, in these picoseconds, super fast, you transfer the electrons to the um, phytoplankton. Phytoplank Meanwhile, um, the water is coming in to replace those electrons, and it's being transferred <coughs> via this manganese calcium um, through this tyrosine residue to P680 to replenish it. For the phytoplankton, that's going to be plastic quinone. You're seeing that quinone, you can picture that structure. It's really similar, right, to ubiquinone. Um, and you get this um, transfer of electrons, um, very similar to ubiquinone, through iron sulfur groups, to this a second um, plastic quinone, and to this PPDA2. As this is formed, you're getting a proton free. So you can see four H plus on this side. So this is the lumen, and this is the side where you're getting the H plus. Oh, I think, oh no. I bet it died. <laughs> Is it four waters or four? Is it four? Is it four per How many? I understand four. Wait, go, go back to your thing. Yes. No, but on there it should say. I don't know. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> I don't know, honestly. You want to see? You, you guys don't have that slide? Where's Debbie? Debbie. You want a four? There you go. It's four people. Debbie said it. <laughs> Debbie said it. Okay, so if you have an answer, you want to answer now. Five, four, three, two, one. We'll see how good I am. Yeah. <laughs>
answer was zero. Was zero. What, what's A? <laughs> no, it's gonna switch my answer. We got on the first three. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, I used to switch. So let's look at the answer. You totally said it. Dang it. Damn it. He told me zero. I was like, oh. No, you fake, homie. No video for you now. No video. Oh I'm one of those five people. I'm one of those five people right now. I'm telling you. Maybe by my last lecture, I'll be. I'm deleting all the videos from YouTube. Because you told me zero. Oh, you fake, homie. Nah, you fake. I'm deleting those videos. <laughs> homie. Okay, so it's four. Like, oh my god. So you need four photons and one electron. Nah, nah. Uh, and no. You can't study with us, homie. You can't study with us. One, you want to understand the process, and two, you want to be able to calculate, right, how many photons of light, because we already did that calculation, right, for the red light, so you can actually see how much energy it would make, you can look at the efficiency, you can figure it out from there. So now we're going to continue with the, um, yeah. Um, let's see how much photons depend on the movement of the light. So if the P680 is actually needing that 680, so and that's where it's absorbing, right? So that's actually why they call it P680. And for bacteria and other things that have a slightly different one, often for more technical, like for classes where they're a little bit more technical, it'll give the number, like P720 or P640. So it's been evolved for 680 in this case. But there's just slight differences to change it. So if we look back now at the Z speed, right? We were here. We went up from the light. We have that charge separation. We moved down to zeophyte, to the plasiquinone. And now we're going to go to the cytochrome um, B F6. B, yeah, BF complex. Um, and so, again, this is similar. We're going to look at it more again in a minute to what you see in oxidative phosphorylation in terms of the type of thing. And then that's passed on, passed on to plasticyanin um, and a proton gradient. So let's look at the details here. So the cytochrome B6 complex, or the plastiquinone plasticyanin oxidative reductase, because that's where it's going from, plastiquinone and plasticyanin, it's really similar to the cytochrome BC1 complex of mitochondria, also called complex 3. So the plasticyanin is similar to cytochrome B6 in mitochondria, right? It has to be soluble, able to move a bit. Um, and then also the PQH2 is lipid soluble, right? And it's similar to the ubiquinone in mitochondria. So what happens here, right, is you have, we're not going to go back into the Q cycle, but just if you review it for your oxidative phosphorylation, you similarly to oxidative phosphorylation, you have this Q cycle that's um, getting electrons and donating electrons. And as part of that, right, it's creating a proton gradient. So you have the electrons that are um, uh, coming in, and then one right from PQH2 is going to cytochrome B, to an iron sulfur center, to cytochrome F, um, then to copper, and then um, the copper within plasticyanin. So again, this is really similar to what you see in the complex three of mitochondria. <laughs> and then meanwhile, we know right that other electron has to come, and there's these sites that go back and forth right to actually replenish the P2 to cycle this. So we need four hydrogens for every two electrons. And you get this, um, I mean, four hydrogens that are produced for every two electrons. You get this really nice pH gradient. And actually, part of the reason it's so strong um, in the chloroplast from the stroma to the lumen side is that the volume is really small in the lumen. And so as you get those H plus going in, right, it really impacts the concentration of H plus within that. Um, that volume, and you get this big pH difference. 
And for any of you who end up working on plants, there are a lot of um, actual proteins, particularly on both sides, that are pH dependent in terms of their activity. And in the light, when you have this happening, you'll see this pH change and you'll get activation or lack of activation. So going back to this skin, the third part, now, right, so we've gone up, we went through the cytochrome B6 complex, we had formation of a proton gradient. We also have a little bit of a proton gradient right forming here. Um, so now we need to continue this. And um, the way that this happens is we need another burst of, of energy, okay? So it's passing it down to the second reactions, the second reaction center, the second photosystem, photosystem one. So in photosystem one, it uses this P700, so slightly different optimal uh, wavelength. Um, it absorbs, it excites, and then you get this transfer. So when we start looking at this transfer, these are really in parallel, they just evolve separately. So actually there's some bacteria or cyanobacter that have one or the other, either photosystem one or two, but plants use both, they couple them. So in this case, the acceptor A0 is similar to the phyton, but people just call it A0. Um, it's kind of a modified chlorophyll that's still not really understood. And then acceptor 1 is actually phyloquinone. So again, similar quinone structure, similar to ubiquinone, um, just very slightly different from phosphoquinone over here. So PQA, and then this is sometimes called QP. Um, and then this goes down to an iron sulfur protein, then it's transferred, so similar to oxidative phosphorylation, then transferred to ferredoxin in this case, a protein that has iron sulfur groups, um, and actually a senior person in our department was instrumental in discovering um, how this works, Bobby Cannon. Um, and then this gets transferred to a flavor protein. Again, sounds familiar in terms of coupling this electron transport um, to finally make NADPH. So again, in your um, oxidative phosphorylation, there's also transfer to a flavor protein. Um, and then you get NADP finally going to NADPH. So you need two photons per reaction center for each NADPH form. So you need two photons here, and you need two photons here. So that would be four, and that's if you use one water. And so don't get confused, it's, um, it's basically sometimes it's shown where you have one water going to half O2, and a lot of times it's shown two waters, right, going to one O2. So then you would just multiply it by two to get eight photons for two H2O, 102 form and 2 NADPH form. So when you're studying this, I would walk through this compared to the oxidative phosphorylation. So now let's look in detail a little bit more at photosystem one. So in photosystem one, we have that reaction center, which is again a pair of chlorophyll A molecules. Slightly different context in the protein gives them that slightly different preference for 700 um, nanometer light. And then, so you get light coming in, it gets ex exciton transfer to that reaction center. It gets passed to that first acceptor, A0, which I said is like pheophyton, but it's some, some kind of modified form of chlorophyll. Gets passed to a phyloquinone. And um, then those two electrons are going into um, basically modifying iron sulfur groups, and then finally to ferredoxin. And then ferredoxin, and this next enzyme, the NADP reductase, is actually um, using ferredoxin to convert NADP. So this will be reduced, then NADP will be reduced to NADPH just like we showed here. So if we look at the whole scheme, right, we have the electron, the light coming in, exciting the P680, transfer here, charge separation, water fills this back up, 
as the electron donor, you move through, so you're always going down the reduction potential, dun 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 dun. You get to this uh, cytochrome B six F complex, um, proton gradient, a bit of a proton gradient here as well, transfer to plasticinin, which can move, right? Similar to what you see in oxidative phosphorylation. Um, these phyloquinones, plastoquinone and phyloquinone over here are similar to ubiquitinone. You get down to P700, the second reaction center in photosystem one now. Again, light comes in, so two photons here, two photons here. Um, then that transfers down and finally ends up as NADPH. So we have a proton gradient, we have NADPH formed. So, of course, what we want to do is couple this proton gradient to ATP synthesis. Um, I personally think that this is a little bit confusing to the way they put it. Um, so just think of it up here, okay, which we'll look at in the next slide. But basically, you have light coming in, right? You have this PQ, just like in oxidative phosphorylation, that's able to move those electrons around to the cytochrome B6F complex. Then you have that soluble plasticinin. So this is soluble in the membrane. This is in the actual like space. Um, and then that transfers to phytosystem two. You need another light coming in, and then finally you get this reduction to NADPH. This uh, proton gradient then is fueled ATP production and the ATP production. So here's the proton gradient on page five to eight. But you could be showing it, which we'll look at in another part of the next slide. Um, right? <coughs> it should actually be shown. I think it's easier to see it here. So this stroma is on both sides, if you look at these pictures. Uh, so the lumen is in the middle, and the stroma is on both sides. So this is fueling right, that proton gradient, the formation of ATP. And you have, um, we'll look again at the ratio of hydrogen to ATP in a minute, but this is exactly not the same oxidative phosphorylation. So the ATP synthase is working exactly the same. So if you look at them again, summarized here, this is this. I like that, I think it's easier to visualize it. You have the lumen side and you have the stroma side. You have photosystem two, plastic window that's helping you move this across. You have this cytochrome complex, the plastic sign in helps you move it to photosystem two. Photosystem two gets more light coming in and you're producing ferrodoxin and NADPH. You have your proton gradient, which is creating driving ATP synthesis. So in summary, and comparing them, we have the mitochondria and the chloroplast, right? They're both happening on membranes, the main, on the mitochondrial membrane here, on the phyloquine membrane here, and this is the alignment of the different um, uh, components. Right with the ATP synthase at the end. So you can see the proton gradient is driving ATP synthesis occurring in the matrix, where we know that all those reactions are occurring in need ATP. And then again in the chloroplast, we have um, the proton gradient driving ATP synthesis in the stroma. <coughs> and as you'll see in a minute, next lecture, the stroma is where you have all carbon assimilation going on. So you have your reactions um, that are using ATP in the matrix, in the mitochondria, and in the stroma, in the chloroplast. <laughs> so if we look at the um, reaction, right, we have, we've seen this probably your whole life, of water and CO2 plus light, going to a carbohydrate plus oxygen plus water. We're going to be looking at this part next time. Um, and then the non-cyclic photophosphorylation, right, you, to do two H2O, it uses eight protons, converted to NADPH, um, and it's using about three ATP to do this. I mean, it's sorry, producing three ATP as part of this process. So when we, oh, I forgot to talk about that here. So, sorry, let me talk about it here. So for oxidose data phosphorylation, um, you had 10, protons for every two electrons, and we made 2.5 ATP. And for photophosphorylation, with four 
photons, you're actually getting six protons per two electrons, and then about 1.5 ATP. And if you look at that, right, um, the reason for that is you have those two here, right? So you're making eight minus two is six. So you can go back and check over this um, after the end of the lecture and compare this with oxidative and phosphorylations. So in the end, this is the summary of what you get. You have the water, the eight photons, you put in NADP and ADP, you get ATP and NADPH. And this is all from the light reaction. So there's just one um, variation on this theme, which is what we talked about was um, non-cyclic, right, the Z scheme, right, so this looks like a Z. Um, but then you can also have a cyclic photophosphorylation. And basically, for cyclic, you only need photosystem one. So what happens, it's not typical. So what happens here is light comes in, it is excited, right, at the P700. It passes down the acceptors. And ferridoxin actually is loosely bound. So it can associate and transfer its electrons to the cytochrome B6 complex. And then it basically keeps going down and down, around and around as long as you have light. So what happens here is you actually are really um, making a nice proton gradient to drive ATP synthesis, but you're not making a new BPH. So if you were to see this, right, and to draw what was happening here, you know, hey, I'm not actually transferring electrons down and making a new BPH, but instead I'm circling, um, but I'm making a nice proton gradient. So if we look back, right, at the cytochrome B6 complex, So when might this happen? Um, so it really doesn't happen very often, but sometimes you'll see it like if under analytic conditions and like bacteria that only have photosystem one are doing something very similar to this. Um, and so and sometimes really, really high light could also result in the same thing. So again, just to emphasize, NADPH is not produced, water is not converted to O2, right? You're not actually not using photosystem, this part of photosystem one in this case. So you're just getting this nice ATP. And we actually finished early. The first time I had. Um, <laughs>